This is the long-awaited 2016 Mazda MX-5. It's about the only simple, affordable driver's car left on the planet. looking at the 2016 Mazda Miata Club Edition. In a Club Edition, no, it does not have a laser light show. It does not have dance music, and it certainly does not have a mini bar in the trunk. But what you do get is forged BBS wheels, Bridgestone tires, and Brembo brakes in the front. Now, of course, there's these front and rear splitters in this black spoiler, but that's really not the big attraction here. This is exactly what you want. This is a stripped down version to take care of autocross and track. In terms of the exterior of this vehicle, you just don't realize how compact and small it is until you get right on top of it. And this is just kind of a view to put it in perspective. This almost takes up one parking spot or one and a half parking spots parked lengthwise. When you put this in your garage, you can almost fit three of these in here in your standard two car garage. It's just very tiny, almost toy-like, but that's also part of the charm here. Now Scott joked around and said, well, this is kind of the little league of sports cars, right? because of its stature, its power output. But when you look at this, it, there's so much functionality going on here. There's aerodynamic purpose in terms of underbody airflow, overbody airflow, in terms of reducing drag, reducing lift. There's a lot going on here from the exterior, aside from just trying to make it bold looking. One thing that Mazda has done extremely well with all of their cars is just kind of unifying their design, interior and exterior. You get along the side, front and back, and especially the interior of most Mazdas, you can tell exactly what it is. And that's really hard to do, and it's hard to do in a good way that most people like, especially the mainstream public. When you come around the front and the back of this new MX-5, the first thing you think is, wow, this looks aggressive, especially compared to any other Miata that's ever been done. While it's aggressive, I don't think it's all that original. Yes, it's uniquely Mazda, but it, yes, it's uniquely everybody else. The standard hexagonal grille. The rear end is a mix between BMW and Jaguar. I think they went safe here. And not only safe, I think they went a little bit modular. And when I say that, it looks like this was designed around being easily refreshable. When you come to the back of the Miata, this is by far the most feminine part of this car. It, it's just so round, it loses a lot of the muscularity. One of the weird things about this Miata is the trunk release location. Assuming you don't have the remote in hand, you actually have to go under the bumper to release it, which, you know, I complained about the Mazda 3's trunk release, but this is even more ridiculous. So what, what we have here is the 2016 Mazda MX-5 Club Edition. It's a Miata. It's a Miata, yes. What do you think about this car when you get underneath it? It's high tech. Driving aside, right? Mm-hmm. This is one of the most interesting underbodies of any car I think we've looked at. As in it sh and it shouldn't be. Right, <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. So up front, what we have here on the Club Edition is the addition of the front splitter, uh, which helps direct airflow. Uh, you have spats on the front, actually in front of the wheels, and actually the whole front of the car to help direct airflow. And then you get to this aluminum panel, which is essentially a skid plate. You do have to remove this to get to the oil filter and um, you know, drain plug bolt. We have all aluminum for the suspension members. This is a true double wishbone suspension. Your lower and upper control arms are all aluminum. Your hub, 
slash knuckle is all aluminum. You have large Brembo brakes, which are completely track capable here. The concept is to be able to run a track day without having any brake fade. Uh, you're going to have a wealth of pad options for this car, probably more so than any other car. Bilstein dampers and retuned springs specifically for the club edition. Uh, this car has true camber adjustment, eccentric bolts built into the front and the rear of the control arm and of course toe adjustment, but there is no caster adjustment on this car, which, you know, it's debatable whether that's completely necessary until you go to aftermarket suspension anyway. But I think it's just the, you know, we were talking about yesterday with the Mustangs, you get under that car, and that's supposed to be a sports car. I mean, honestly, with that type of power, and they put all that engineering under the hood, the trans, and then everything else is kind of like, yeah, you know, let's just throw your stand, whatever we have in the parts bin at the suspension. Yeah, but it's no different than the other American performance cars, excluding Cor Corvettes and stuff like that. Right. But that's a top tier type right. sports car. But they're all the same. They're all rental cars. <laughs> well, yeah. That's it's, the way it's, I look at it. true, true. I mean, there's just not a lot of, there's not the engineering that is here in those type of other sports cars. And you just have to wonder why, especially in this price range. But the I think the big thing with this car is Mazda has a huge stake in this. This is their kind of, uh, honestly, their halo car. They don't really have anything else in terms of engineering. They've had so many years with spec Miata and racing that they've developed this, developed it and developed it, that this is what it is. It's just kind of a factory almost motorsports race car for them. So it makes sense, but it's just strange that you don't see this from other manufacturers. So the next thing, we move towards the middle of the car with the transmission and the, the middle area here. So what have they done, Scott? Changed everything. All new transmission. All lighter weight than the previous one. The trans? 15 pounds lighter. Wow. What's the, what about the case? Is there something you were talking about they did with that? They use different thicknesses to strengthen it where it needs to be strengthened and lighter where it doesn't need to be strengthened. Save weight. What about the, you were talking about the smoothness of the gearbox? Yeah, it's fucking amazingly smooth. Usually uh, transmissions have the, what, uh, grid lines in them right, for whatever, strength? Kind of like this. Yeah. Something similar to that. <clears throat> it's also a one-to-one -one gear ratio in six gear, which is pretty crazy. Why? Why would they do that? Give you closer gear ratios. Everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't. I mean, it's a little force on. You don't need overdrive. True. <clears throat> and you can tell when you're shifting this thing. I mean, it's like you're flying through those gears. Mm -hmm. That's and part you of. You look down. You're like, oh man, I'm only going 40 miles yeah. an hour. <laughs> eighth gear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's what. That's really the fun of driving this car. It gives you that sense of speed where. There really is any. Yeah, you can beat the hell out of this car and not go to jail. Right. Yeah. With the GT, you'd probably end up jail if you drove it as hard as you could this car. Right. Yep. <laughs> or the hospital. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, what about these actual That's panels? All, aluminum, all new aluminum, too. All this bracing? I believe this one and this one is new, and then this, whatever you want to call that thing. That, this is Mazda. I forget the name of it. Uh, that is Mazda's equivalent of the torque tube. Torque tube. Yeah. So they use this center monster aluminum brace that connects the transmission to the rear differential. And they do this in a way to avoid having to, well, not only to strengthen the drivetrain so you don't get this strange judder and it strengthens everything together, but they don't have to use crazy bushings in the back that will increase harshness and vibration. So this is kind of the structural brace to connect the whole car together. And they've been doing this for a while, but it's slightly improved yeah, I mean, on this. it's nothing new. Camaro's had that, and I'm right. sure countless other cars have done it, too. But they found a way here to lighten it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a really light structural beam with holes all along the aluminum to, to cut weight but keep rigidity. I think this one, the aluminum's half as much as the other one was. Okay. So the previous generation Miata had, what was it, four or five ball joints in the rear? I think it was four. Four? Okay. I don't remember. The, the reason that Mazda had that in their previous model, and this is from their engineering, was it created a more direct feel in the rear. And they said that having the ball joints, that many in the back, reduced uh, bump steer. And not only did it do that, but it actually improved steering feel. Like the actual steering feel is more direct with the ball joint setup. Now, the big thing really is 
the extensive use of aluminum everywhere. I mean, there is just more aluminum on here, uh, front, rear panels, uh, everything has, you know, focus has been weight reduction. I think that was the first thing years ago before we even saw the launch or anything, you knew that Mazda's primary focus of this car was weight reduction. They wanted it to be lighter than pretty much even the first generation mm -hmm. car. Which is crazy with all the nonsense they have to have. <laughs> right. So they maintained somehow to make this advanced in terms of suspension design for this price range and pretty simple, which we don't see anymore. Uh, in, in the back, again, you were saying we have pretty much every adjustment here possible. Mm -hmm. You're already set up for camber, toe adjustment in the back. You're ready to go. You go get an alignment and you head to the track and you're done. Now it's towed in all the time and you get progressive towing as the suspension collapses. Well, that one I guess was more towing out and that's why it felt like the car was rotating all right. the time. More like rear, a rear wheel steer, steer feel. Okay, so now they've reduced the tow out effect and now the rear end is going to tow in under load especially, right? That was it's more neutral. More neutral. I mean, so no, you definitely, I mean, that car felt like it was rotating at 10 miles an hour. Right. You didn't have to drive it hard. Okay. So that's something to note. You know, if you're looking at this car, the rear end is going to behave a lot differently than the previous generation because there, there is, I mean, it's a pretty big redesign in terms of overall just dynamics, what they want. redesigned, really. Yeah. There's a lot going on underneath. And it, it's funny how small this car looks when you're standing next to it, because it li literally it's is. Yeah, it's really small. It's really low. But this, for me, this is one of the biggest disappointments here. What's the power on the 2.5? The 2.5 is in the 180s. And what, this is 155? This is 155, and that's essentially what the 3 makes. Now, the only thing they've changed here from this motor and the Mazda 3 is, what, just a couple things? The exhaust manifold and the intake. Okay. Just probably made them smaller. <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> probably it's more compact to fit it. Uh, the other thing that they did was this is specifically tuned for high octane fuel. So you know, obviously the regular two liter in the Mazda three, it's four eighty seven octane or low octane fuel. So you can you know you don't have to put premium. But this makes more power, and the power band changes if you're using premium fuel in here. So and it is noticeable, especially with less weight. It always feels peppy, but it's not like my God, you know, you're never blown away when you're, you're, you're driving this thing. Yeah, but again, that's not what they designed it for, which we all get. Right. They need to make a Type R model. Yeah, this is, this sound, you know, we talk about how you never really, a four-cylinder never sounds good, but this sounds pretty decent for a four-cylinder. It's about as good as a four-cylinder can get for a street car. The other thing to note is I talked to three different service managers out in our area because we always talk about this in every video with direct injection because now this is the first Miata with direct injection on it. And we know that valve intake valve maintenance is becoming pretty much nonsense on mm -hmm. modern cars. It's, a, it's become a real hassle and a pain in the ass. So Mazda is all direct injection now. So that's something else you're gonna have to deal with here. But I did call these service managers in three different higher volume dealerships. Well, the one out here is not high volume, but the ones in the Chicagoland area, I asked them specifically what they're having to do on the two and the 2.5 liter Mazdas. And they said it's almost a non-existent issue with these motors because they're using an air oil separator uh, before the PCV valve and it's actually eliminating a lot of that blow by and a lot of the carbon is not building up on the valves like the co competitors cars. How long has the direct injection been out for? It's probably seven years. So this is not new for them. This is, well, it's new for the Miata, but this motor out clearly right. is not new. So that's something that's really positive here because you know that would be a worry, uh, especially if you're, you're gonna be running this car flat out on a track and that's where you're gonna get the most blow by and all that. Um, in terms of oil vapors getting back into that intake manifold. But it doesn't seem to be an issue, that's the point. I've never been a MX-5 owner, but I was one of those people that stayed up to watch the live stream, the actual unveiling of the car online last year. 
I was pretty excited because it's honestly been about 10 years since we've had a new MX-5. So this is kind of a big deal. Now being behind the wheel, it's the expectation level has been built up. And of course, the initial press is extremely positive. So let's start to drive this thing right through the turns and see how it does. Let's take a look at the acceleration. The MX-5 Miata, the new two liter in this car, all direct injected. It only makes about 155 horsepower. But as me and Turbowski started to play around with this car a little bit, and we had the EcoBoost Mustang, we realized right away this is almost identical in terms of zero to 60 times when you're just doing a street start. I mean, they are almost neck and neck. And that's a car that's you know well over 300 horsepower. So there's something to be said here about the weight of this vehicle and just, I mean, the overall tuning of this two liter. Now granted, this is kind of the Achilles heel for most enthusiasts uh, that like power is the Miata has always been down on that and that's clearly that's still the same problem with this car but because of the weight because of the way they've tuned this two liter which is of course shared with other mazdas it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like a total putter it feels really quick and the best thing about this car is you can go you can go flat out pretty much in every turn everywhere you go uh, without fear of absolutely losing your license, without getting in a total, um, just a mess of trouble. Because when you're going through the gears, you feel like you should be going 150 miles an hour with the way that this thing feels like it's accelerating. But you look down and you're really only going about 55, 60 miles an hour. And for a street car, that is really awesome. Check this out. Now, if I would have done that in a higher horsepower car, I would have been probably well over 100 miles an hour by then. And there, I'm barely breaking the speed limit, and it feels like you just have such pace. And I have to say, I'm not kidding you. You want to go flat out in this car all the time. And as much as I'm going to bag on the fact that they've recycled this two liter motor over and over again, 90% of this car's fun and appeal is the fact that you have something that is completely manageable in this car to do that with, to, to go flat out. If you had more power, it would make it more edgy. It would require more suspension complications. It would make it less drivable. And the biggest factor for me here is driving this car like a maniac, I am getting almost identical fuel economy to my Mazda 3. And I'm at 32.1 miles per gallon for this tank average. And that is just absolutely incredible. And when I'm not driving it like a maniac, I've seen as much as 36, 37 miles per gallon. And there's no doubt that you could probably pull almost 40 in here if you're on the highway.
this car just handles so well and one of the reasons is they've just kind of redone the rear suspension on this car uh, it's towing in on your turn now and on your turn in and you just always get this sense of confidence when you're turning it doesn't feel like the back wants to step out on you all the time and that's part of the reason why you can just be foot to the floor in almost every turn it's just so satisfying the other thing too is reviewers have talked about how this car just tends to roll around a lot and one of the reasons why Mazda has engineered roll into the suspension is, and this is a quote from them, they tend to put more body roll in the Miata because most of the best roads in America at least have some of the worst conditions or they're the worst maintained roads. So you want to go on a twisty road, a lot of times the pavement is in bad shape. Having that extra compliance in the chassis, having that extra body roll really helps to uh, keep the car in line. It's not hopping and skipping all over the place and it's more comfortable. So while there is roll here, it's engineered on purpose because this is a street car mostly, right? So when you get, get the car going, you feel the way that the car, car kind of rolls into the turn and it rolls and then sets. The suspension kind of rolls and sets and then grips. It's not an on and off switch where it grips and then you start to get oversteer, understeer. This car doesn't do that. It, it just is one of the more neutral cars you can get into. A lot of people are gonna be asking, well, what about it? How is it compared to this car, that car, oh, blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, that comparison is always gonna be made. You look at a car like the FRS and BRZ, which I think is pretty much the closest competitor here, even though it's not a convertible. Uh, this is a better car, front, front to back. I mean, you get in it, you really don't have to do much. You're not sitting here thinking, well, I'm gonna need to do tires, I'm gonna need to do uh, you know, suspension modifications. This thing is just set up so well that you can go and just take it to the track and autocross and even just go for a get an alignment if you need more camber for aggressive driving. You can do that in this car without touching a thing. And I like that a lot, and that's one of the biggest strengths of the new MX-5. One of the things you typically don't hear from reviewers about cars, especially this car, is you don't hear the negatives. You don't hear them really slamming anything about it. And there is so much good here, but there's also things that are kind of annoying. And that is there is cowl shake here. This, this frame is rigid for convertible, but it still feels like a convertible. You don't feel that sense of rigidity on a car like you do on the FRS and BRZ where that you just feel solid all the time. This thing is especially over the bumps. It, it transmits so much vibration and twist into the cabin. And it actually translates into a lot of that in terms of my cameras, which have really good image stabilization on them. So you'll see that a lot more in this video. And you can feel it for sure. Now, yes, it's a part of the driving experience, but it's something to note about having a convertible. The other thing you don't have to worry about on the MX-5 is, brakes and that's because the car doesn't weigh anything i mean even with the standard brakes on this car a good set of brake pads are going to do you fine now this car has the brembo option here and uh, honestly this is probably going to get you through 95 percent of your track days you'll probably have to swap some pads and some good fluid in but again that's nothing that's you're really going to have to worry about is the braking here one of the best parts of the miata and just driving this car in general is just this, the open top experience, being connected with your environment around you. And I said this about my last review in the MX-5, and it's just something that you can't really uh, put into words until you drive this. Driving the MX-5 with the top up, well, it sounds windy in here. <laughs> Even with the windows up, there's just a lot of road noise. Of course, that's because this top is essentially paper thin. And, you know, it, it is what it is. This is the, one of the negative parts about a convertible in this type of soft top is you just don't have the quiet interior. You lose that open air feeling. And in a lot of cases, if you're a bigger person, you're gonna feel more claustrophobic in here. This is a small cockpit for sure. Uh, does it kill it for me? Well, as a daily driver, yes, especially if you're in a cold climate like the Midwest or any place that has snow and salt, this is not something that you would really long for to drive all year round. Although, you know, in the summer when you have nice weather, it 
you make the excuses for it because it's so much fun to drive with the top down, but it, it's nowhere near as thrilling as it is, uh, you know, driving with the top, top down. Getting inside the MX-5, well, it feels smaller than the previous generation in some ways. And in some ways it feels bigger, more competently laid out. Ergonomics are greatly improved. It's just refreshed. You know, they, they've taken a lot of the cues they have from the other Mazda vehicles and, and put them here. This is a cross between a Scion IA, or which is a Mazda 2, and a Mazda 3 interior. That's the only way I can put it. Now, as you'd expect, the MX-5 is truly a driver-centric cockpit. It's free of most of the lard you're finding on most modern cars. It, it lacks crash mitigation, blind spot monitoring, uh, vibrating and massaging seats. Really, this is about just driving and controlling this vehicle. So let's go over some of the perceived nice features here. This dashboard, so simple. The gauges are so easy to read. But more than that, if you're looking to use this car for motorsports or you're gonna turn it into a race car, this entire dash could probably be taken out of here in about 30 minutes. It is so small. It, that's really nice. The second thing is we actually have cloth seats. Uh, and the adjustability and the comfort of these are excellent for just basically a stock car. You can tell they probably weigh about 30 pounds each tops. The audio system in this car, now you wouldn't think that it would be any good. Parting politely takes a lot of effort, skill, and knowledge. I mean, it is actually surprisingly good, specifically when you're using USB audio or CD audio. Scott and I did a little test with this little Bose key that was preloaded with music. And I could not believe how clear the audio system in, in here was without breaking up. Now it lacks some high and it lacks some sharpness, but overall you're going to be extremely satisfied with the overall sound reproduction in here. But as expected, your Bluetooth audio does sound compressed along with Sirius, which sounds compressed on every single car. Now while the audio system is extremely good in here and then the infotainment is unified, there were some problems we ran into with this guy. And this is one of the first negative experiences I've had with it. The navigation allows you to see the street names that are coming up here. With this system, it froze up constantly on a, a name of a street you are no longer at. The problem with that is, is it disables your ability to actually turn off the display at night. It's so bright and you know it's a big distraction because it's line of sight. We could not get the display to turn off without the backlight being on and even after restarting it. So that was a big deal. The second thing, and this affected Turbowski more and some of the other people that drove this, is the center control knob, the central command knob for this interface. It's right where your hand lays for your shifter, so you're constantly hitting it. That's a big deal. One of the biggest welcome surprises, this headrest. And why is that a big deal? Because your Bluetooth call speaker's in there. You can hear all the callers really clearly, even with the windows down. Now you get above 60 and it gets a little dicey, but for the most part, this is one of the best designed uh, Bluetooth calling systems for phone calls I've been in, considering it's a convertible, it's exceptional. Probably plenty of you are getting sick and tired of hearing how wonderful of a car this is and how great of a car it is to drive. But how is it as a practical, usable daily driver? And this is actually one of its weakest points. Go figure. I mean, it is a small car. But at the same time, the, the level of interior storage just blows. It's even worse than the S2000, if you can believe that. There is no door storage, no pockets, no nooks. It's almost like I wish they would have contacted the engineers from Honda who, who designed the Odyssey to figure out some hidden methods to store things. Your areas of storage are limited to this place or cubby right in front of the shifter, which happens to be on an incline, of course. So anything you put in there flies out at you when you're driving. The next place is this little armrest, which is good enough to hold keys, an iPass, and maybe a small phone from like 1970. Well, actually, probably 9, 2006, because that's when flip phones were out. The next area is these cup holders. If you're shifting, your arm is constantly bumping them. It's hard to get comfortable with them here, so you actually have to remove these cup holders if you really want to get comfortable, which means, of course, you're not going to have storage there. You go to this back area, and this is where all your storage is. You can put your sunglasses, everything, but it's really hard to get at while you're driving. You almost have to turn around and open it up. It just sucks, bottom line. They need to add some storage in the doors or something or on the sides or create a side pocket to hold stuff. There's no sunglass holder up here. There's no glove box.
but there is a hidden uh, place behind each seat to store your ballet slippers, or in Scott's case, a size five driving shoes. Oh, that's a nice, nice cubby hole. Mm -hmm. Do you put your ballet slippers in there too? Yeah, for when I want to drive hard, I change shoes. What do you, what shoes do you drive? Usually cowboy boots when I wear my NASCAR shirt. Oh, okay. I thought you used flip flops to drive. <laughs> Now, yes, I may have been a little brat about the interior cargo volume, but this trunk space, despite it being small, is extremely well equipped to handle a lot of stuff. I never thought it would fit all my camera gear, but I fit my drone case in here, which is huge, my main camera case, a slider, a full-size tripod, and a whole bunch of other mounts. The only thing I had to put in my front seat was my backpack, and that's really surprising. But the thing is with this, you better be ready to play Tetris with it because it is like a puzzle trying to get everything in there perfectly. Now, yes, I'm probably going to catch some flack because this car isn't about interior cargo capacity. It's about driving, and that's what it does best. But there are some practical considerations here. They're easily fixed over the next couple years with refreshes, updates. They can do all this stuff I'm complaining about. The solid foundation of this car is excellent. If you're looking for a simple, no bullshit driver's car, a weekend car, a toy, this is it. You add the fuel economy on top of it, I would venture to say if you live in a good climate, this could be a great daily driver. So that's about it for the MX-5. What do you think overall? It's a pretty fun car to drive. The only thing I would do is get rid of that stupid ass screen on the dashboard. They should have a... I they, hate that. I know you hate it, and a lot of people really hate it. I'm used to it from driving the Mazda 3 around. Yeah, but your arm constantly hitting the button, turn, you got the screen shut off, you shift, the fucking screen turns on. Yeah. I, I mean, that's that would be my biggest complaint. That's, I don't know, that is completely unnecessary. If they're going to keep it, they should have that being utilized for what this car is. You should have oil pressure, oil gauges, you should have that thing being used right, in terms it, of a performance perspective for this car. It wouldn't be that hard to do. No. It's all software. Right. But other than that... It's fun. That's my biggest complaint. I mean, other than that, it looks good. Drives good. It's fun, you know, it's fun around the corners. Just leaves you wanting more. More, where's the power? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That that's actually my biggest gripe with it, too, is this is a great car that is kind of back to that FRS BRZ. Well, this is way better than FRS or BRZ. I'm sorry, in terms of a platform, it, th these people knew what they were doing engineering. They didn't take shortcuts in terms of the chassis. Well, this is the real deal, but this is, no, you know. Because it is what it is. It's not it intended to be a freaking rocket. Yeah, true. Yes, they should make a rocket edition, but. that That's, that's the thing, right? I, I know people are gonna disagree with this i think you're you're you have the right mentality it is what it is that's not designed to be a rocket but there's a lot of cars and this is something the american car companies do right you have multiple tiers multiple engine choices and i know that's expensive for a small company like mazda to do and develop but you have an option if this is not good enough you have a high performance version a balls to the wall they version should make a ridiculous version yeah. but then it's going to be 40 50 grand and i would pay 40 grand if this thing was like 250 bucks. Like when I was when I got to drive those M coupes and M roadsters, those things were amazing to drive. When I was at 300 horsepower or right. something. Yeah. But again, that price tag is astronomical. Right. But it's something like this, I mean, 300 horsepower, I don't think you need that. No, I don't think it needs I think that. S2000 territory power, at least 200. Yes. But I think that the magic mm -hmm. the magic point. 